Welcome to the Bleed Red Blacks podcast. Best fans in the league right here, baby! With your hosts, Colin and Mike. <laughs> Susie Q, Susie Q. Produced by Mark and Johnny Z. Bleed Red Black starts now. Podcast for all things red black. This complete on the near side, Sinopoli makes a tackle into the end zone, touchdown! It's Brad Sinopoli! Every season, Active pass throws it's intercepted, and this is going to be a pick six into the end zone for a touchdown. It's Jarrell Gavin! Touchdown, Ottawa! All season. First and 10, Ottawa for the BC 30. Here's Burris throwing into the end zone, Ellingson, and it right. is caught! Oh, what a catch by Greg Ellingson! Hello and welcome to episode 23 of the Bleed Red Blacks podcast. I'm Colin, I'm joined here with my two partners in crime, the one and only season ticket holder Mike, 23 Skidoo, what's up? 23, Michael Jordan, um, and the 23, the number of the Illuminati. There you go. (laughs) And uh, producer Mark, what's up man? What's going on boys? Not too much. Feeling human again? Yeah, that's good. That's good. You are looking human. Yeah. So yeah. take that as a compliment. I cured myself of Ebola. Uh, I had a boy. Yeah. That's good. I knew someone could do it. Anyways. Um, no more bleeding out of my rectum. <laughs> okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, should we start this over again or what? Uh, anyways, <laughs> people wanted more football. We went the other direction. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, playoffs, baby, playoffs. and it was a uh, it was a sloppy game, you know. Yeah, sloppy Joe, slop, sloppy <laughs> Joe. <laughs> I made him extra sloppy, sloppy for you. <laughs> I know how you kids like them sloppy. <laughs> um, but yeah, we won, so we uh, kind of uh, put ourselves in a pretty awesome position now, um, as far as home field advantage or the opportunity to do so moving forward. Yeah, I'm sure we'll talk about that, but uh, yeah, it's like if we. Kind of a win in your end scenario, and if we split against the Thai Cats, it's uh, whoever gets the most points. So, almost like a Euro soccer final or something. But this back to back could be interesting. Yeah, welcome to the Bleed Red Blacks first podcast playoff friendly edition. So that feels pretty good. I didn't think yeah. we'd ever get here, um, but uh, here we are a year later. Uh, you and I had a nice little chat on the drive in to South Keys, talking about how last year at this time it was really tough to stay positive about the team and everything that went with that uh, loss record last year was tough on fans. It was tough on the city and, mm-hmm. and I imagine those players as well. And of course, uh, a couple of rat packers like us down in a basement doing a podcast. It wasn't, wasn't the most positive thing to, uh, yeah, we, to had, we had some tough shows for sure. And I remember leaving here pretty sour. Um, another thing that, that has kind of gone away with that is, uh, leaving the game sour. I remember last year we had a yeah. few times where, you know, and, and it's weird because you kind of put it into perspective and you're like, you know, we have the opportunity to go watch professional sports as like a as a luxury and we're leaving here feeling entitled and stuff. And I didn't like that. So I like where we're at now. We're all in a good place. Yep. And uh, speaking of sour, eh? like a week ago, we got rid of uh, a big sour puss up there on the hill. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, a week a week ago now, we were scrambling to get to the polls and make our uh that was a hello, uh, hello, JT. You know, I wish Justin Timberlake is awesome, <laughs> right? Like, man, but you gotta love those classic. Bautista memes. Yeah, obviously. Yeah, <laughs> nice. Harper. There was this. The there was so much happening, right? Like within that time period, that I, I think the internet like really flexed its muscles, and Twitter really flexed its muscles, and like, yeah, those memes going from like Batista to like hitting Harper o- over the fence and they just kept on going and going and going. Snowballing it's oblivion. amazing, right? Oh, like it's amazing. seeing like all pop culture just kind of merge into one big social media, I don't know, melange. It's this big like crazy orgy of craziness. It's My favorite's always been watching the pollsters after the election when they try to explain how they were so far off the mark it wasn't even funny. Yeah. But uh it was uh, what an outcome. Did you watch this? Did you watch the uh, the coverage, the CBC I, coverage? I did. Yes. Okay. So as a math guy, I was oh, yeah. so on tilt. When I know you're gonna, you I know you know what I'm gonna say. So they'll be like, they were displaying this data, and they're basically like, you know, this is setting up to be a huge ep- upset because of X, um, with one 
polling station counted of, of 182, yeah. <laughs> and the votes are 27, 14, and nine. Like, Sample size. Like, son. what's the standard deviation on that? Like, seriously, like, I just I couldn't believe. I'm like, I want to reach to the TV and just nerd out on this person. What do you just, think the weathermen do on election night? Obviously, they're picking what's going to happen. Working on their CV. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So, it's gonna rain tomorrow, sure. Yeah, I saw a tweet. probably using that blue screen to do a new uh, CFL podcast. <laughs> I'm imagining. <laughs> I saw a twinkle in Mansbridge's eyes, though, sitting across from Wendy Messley. So, oh, <laughs> oh, some, oh, yeah, some old heartstrings being pulled right there. Real old heartstrings. Yeah. And, uh, my God, she still looks good. Though, Actually, eh? the strings are made of burlap. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, <laughs> she's a beauty, though. Yeah. So, anyways. Um, Regardless of how you feel about it, um, I was very proud um, that my neighborhood, uh, Mike here in my neighborhood as well, highest voter turnout in the country, 82%. Um, so good on us. Um, shocked. I'm shocked with the results, though. Um, it was a, it was considered one of the largest upsets in the country. Uh, yeah. Mr. Paul Dewar is on his way out. Uh, he's yeah. part of the transition team with NDP and... Uh, Bless him, he'll find a he'll find a job somewhere, no doubt about it. But yeah, uh, it's a big loss for Ottawa Center, really. Yeah, I'm yeah. leaving. I actually we're moving. No, <laughs> no word of lie. <laughs> Legit. I, no, legitimately, I I talked to Colin yesterday about it, and uh, so I'll go somewhere else now. I'll Come on go. down to the Keys. Is it orange down here? <laughs> no. no. All right. It's a McGinty riding, of course. Yeah, it's yeah I know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, Don't get me started. So I guess that was the night. Uh, I mean, there were some other dreams that were smashed this week, um, including the Blue Jays, and all Blue Jays fans were kind of brought back down to earth. Um, we, I think we did as well as we could have expected, um, considering you know when we put this team together. And uh, I'm sure I speak for all Blue Jays fans when I'm very disappointed, but obviously very proud of the team and uh, the display that they put on. And for those of you who still think baseball is boring, um, you're, you're a lost cause, basically. Yeah. So <laughs> It's good on the team. Jose Bautista looked absolutely magical, even in this final moments of, of losing that game. Yeah, uh, he, just a great, uh, he's got a good eye for that uh, high inside fastball. And uh, boy, you don't want to leave it up. That was, I think it was a, I think one of them was a hook that just stayed a little high, and like that ball was gone right off his bat. So. Yeah, he um, obviously has has been rubbing some people the wrong way um, with his theatrics, but uh, a guy who chirps about wanting to be in the opportunity to play in a playoff uh, game and and be that leader, and to finally get that chance and step it up, um, that's amazing. They talk is cheap, and he 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 brought it, and I would have loved to see what he could have done. If uh, if we didn't get our, our hearts broken there in Kansas City, mm -hmm. anyways, um, Regina update. So when, yeah, that, yeah. when we went to Regina, my, <laughs> my <laughs> here it comes. Yeah, brace yourselves. <laughs> Regina is coming. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Line up the prairie memes now. Let me tell you. Um, so my dad had heard this thing about this hot dog that had pierogies on it, and we weren't able to find it. But uh, uh, Greg. Um, from uh, Sask, from Saskatchewan, awesome Twitter follower. Um, actually tweeted a photo out. He found one. It was a, a a dog with some pierogies on it. So good on Greg for doing that recon. Um, I don't know if there's any way you could kind of mail that to us. Um, <laughs> but if you could, uh, just DM uh, producer Mark and he'll give you his uh, address. So, all right. Yeah, let's have it show up here. Good idea. <laughs> Don't, don't let us get it started on that communal mailbox he's using down the street. Let's move on. <laughs> uh, so last week was amazing ha I... having the OSEG reps in here. Yep. It was so fun, and uh, both uh, Kabina and Damien were just awesome people, um, really fun and, and great to have around. And uh, I hope I hope we, we get them in here more often. Uh, it was just a really fun vibe and, and good to see two uh, motivated, um, youthful uh, parts of that team that are actually really important parts of that team come in and kind of do their thing and uh, yeah just kind of little little a uh, little jealous of their gig gotta be honest but uh, I'm really happy for them and uh, I'm sure they'll do big things moving forward it was enough to talk me into re-upping I'm in that's right so you are officially in what well, you got like a key to the lumber yard is that how that works or I, what's the deal yeah I don't know yet I'll uh, okay yeah I'll, I'll see it out I got a great email from uh Kobina on uh, the other day, so she yeah. let me know I'm part of a lumber yard or something. I think I got to put work boots on and go chop down the trees and 
stack them up in the berm so nobody can see next year or whatever but uh <laughs> cool i got a pair of work boots that i don't have too many clicks on them so if you need to borrow them <laughs> you let me know they should be but, good to go <laughs> yeah. i've got a pair that are limited to coffee stains so <laughs> <laughs> no when i bought mine i just sprayed orange paint on them so the boys thought i did something uh, uh, all right Andy, um, welcome to the Acon uh, podcast, <laughs> <laughs> boys. <laughs> um, uh, great though. I, I had a great time at your place yesterday. Thanks for the invite over to uh, F F H Q F F F H Q. That's right. The Bengals had a bye week, so it was a good time. I was allowed to, to come uh, over. <laughs> yeah, and uh, another member of our fantasy football um, uh, group was in town. So Hey Now was in town, and uh, she loves to gamble. Hey so now. her and I. <laughs> Like having a partner in crime, like yeah. we were going nuts at Max to the point where we we're snapping Nevadas off at the. <laughs> I'm not joking. Yeah, we cherries. went there. Yeah, cherries. <laughs> yeah. So in typical Nevada um, investment type of style, you yep. invest five to win two. Yeah. Then you invest two to win one, and then you leave. So yeah, but it's fun, right? So <laughs> got cherries three times. So you know. Hey now, there she really go. liked my. Uh, she liked my version of of pro line, which is usually what I do now this year is because I've. I've we call them coasters. If anybody in the pro line world knows, um, there's That's a all I call and them. coasters range from two dollars up to one hundred, depending on what kind of coaster you're looking for. Yeah, and what that does is you basically you fold your pro line ticket in half and you put your drink underneath it as soon as it's a loser, which is probably about one point two seconds after you purchase the ticket. So I've uh, I hate pro line odds so much. I just now what I do for excitement because I need that gambling excitement. I just walk up to Max Milk and I open up the door and I throw in twenty dollars where the like quarters and dimes <laughs> just fired it. and then i just run and it's just, <laughs> honestly god it's the same thrill as that guy yelling at me why are you doing this <laughs> and, and i go you know what it feels good and i'm gone i'm out that's it and uh to be honest with you you're expediting the whole strategy for sure that's, that's and why why even print off the ticket and then that's you can move saying. on yeah, i can yeah. move on with myself and the good thing to this somebody is does something with that 20 the bucks. business owner enjoys his money yep and uh no one's taking any juice off it so no. you're actually it's actually rake free entertainment sometimes Sometimes the quarters nice. get into the fridge and other areas, but whatever. I mean, it's part of the process. Man. If you get a Slurpee that tastes a little tinny, you yeah, know, there might be a is. nickel in there, but whatever. But yeah, I love it. Um, Fury, we've got a big game coming up. Yeah, apparently, yeah, we, we took it down. We took down the fall season, so good on them. And uh, just another OSAG group, uh, you know, like the Red Blacks that are really succeeding uh, in their early years. And I think that's amazing. And uh, I don't know when the next game is, to be honest. Uh but it's it's soon, I, I assume, and it's it's going to be November cold. November 8th. Okay. Burr. Burr. Yeah, that could be a frigid time it's to crazy go to the too, barn. It's crazy, too, because you got impact in the playoffs. Everything's happening at once for soccer in this region. So, uh, yeah, amazing. So, um, last week, um, we received uh, a package from uh, our super fan, friend of the show, um, REM enthusiast, um uh coach far coach far uh, i got home after the podcast yeah to my mailbox uh my mailbox is attached to my house by the way um <laughs> uh, with a, a great little package from uh, coach far and he sent uh, a great little group of uh local the local newspaper sports edition talking all about uh the georgia uh bulldogs which is amazing cool and just like little information packs about Athens, which was great because my wife's like, this is awesome. She's going to go through it again. Just reminds us of the great trip we had there. And, I'll, yeah. and you and I are going to share this. So I'll, I'll pass it uh, the rest of the paper off when I'm finished reading it. And a couple of little awesome decals, including a ticket, a game use ticket. So we're going to, yeah, we're going to build a little bit of a bleed red blacks. Um, I don't know, something. You know, where we keep some of our... I don't want to call it a wall of fame. That sounds fame. too cliche. Too cliche. I was thinking maybe like a pizza box of awesome. Yes. Um, and then we can just pin stuff to the pizza box. Something like that, you know. This one bulldog illustrated, though, it's flagged. If you ever saw that episode of uh, Seinfeld, it's flagged. Okay. Just leave it at that. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> How did they know? Sorry, know. sir. It's been flagged. And we got All right, the, will you hang on to that one yourself? Then, I love but. this little game, too. He's, he's, he's so great. Send me this lower-level $45 ticket stub. Uh, Georgia against South Carolina. Georgia's 5-2 and two right now. They're second in their division. They had a they had a stellar game. I think they won 9-6 this weekend, I believe. Uh, so, Well, that's, just, that's awesome, him setting up there and setting that up 
stuff to us and like and you uh, and i are putting a package together you and i had a little confusion about some of the product we had on our way but we <laughs> sorted that out no, save it don't save it for the show but uh Brady we'll pizza yeah we <laughs> tried to say, so uh i figured that would be cool i mean it's just pay by weight it's like what's in here i'm like what do you think like smell <laughs> So Coach Coach Farr and his Georgia Red Blacks uh, fan group, they'll be getting a nice little bleed Red Blacks package from us and include some Red Blacks gear and whatnot. And I want to – I'm actually going to wait till the playoffs start because I want to get him a uh, – I want to send him a newspaper with our playoff stats and yeah. stuff. You know what I mean? Just I want something cool. that's, that's our first playoffs and send him something like that. So look forward to that in the mail down there in Athens, Coach, and thank you so much. You're awesome, Coach. Thank you. The best thing about Coach – is um, originally we thought that he was um, uh, an older black man. Yes, right. We did. We did. I just I know that's his Twitter picture. And uh, the day we had him on the show, he he told us, "No, that's me as a baby in Heinz Ward's hands. I'm the baby. <laughs> that's not me. I'm not the dude." <laughs> that's a hilarious story, right? We're like, I thought he was Heinz Ward. <laughs> I thought you actually thought Coach Far was Heinz Ward. What the hell? But I know, I... anyway, this jokes on us. But uh, thanks for the swag, buddy. That's amazing, and we'll we'll hook you up soon as well. Um, really quickly, just shout out to. The Prescott um, went there to watch uh, the Red Blacks game on Saturday, and uh, it was a great time. Um, Italian Putin, what's up? I uh, wished I could have made it, boys, but uh, I was uh, worshipping the porcelain god after my trip out to the uh, new bar on uh, Miravale on Friday night, which ended rough. That's okay. Well, <laughs> hanging out in Miravale never really ends well, to be honest yeah. with you. Just, yeah. just, that's your, that's your... It's like Mr. White's uh, neighborhood over there. Like, it's... It's pretty, it's pretty sketchy. Some Walter? Of, Walter White's <laughs> over there. Yeah, a little blue meth is over there, I heard. <laughs> so lastly, yeah. uh, we had a little loss in our community last week. Um, a place that was very special to us, not only from a uh, podcast meeting and just local community hangs perspective, but also uh, just three, uh, just the, where we go to buy all our snackage. But uh, three local businesses, a coffee shop, a bakery, and a, an shop. Iranian nut store. Oh. Um, and my burnt, wife's tattoo shop, uh, burnt, Jim, Jimmy's t- tattoo shop, burnt burnt to the down as well. as well. And uh, there were some residents of that area, uh, that building, who were displaced as well. And uh, it's weird; like there aren't doesn't seem to be a lot of fires anymore. You know? Yeah. Uh, that like are, just that are five alarms like that. Yeah. yeah so it was just luckily, no one was hurt. But it is tough to see uh, something that kind of had some sentimental value to you, a place kind of the yeah. birthplace of this. It was the, it birth- was the birthplace. If it wasn't for yeah. that coffee shop. Uh, we'd be recording this over Skype or not right yeah, now, you and, right? The quick story is you and I basically, Colin and myself, had put uh, a lot of time and effort into trying to write this show and put it together and find out a way to produce it. And um, it just happened. And that was a place you and I met quite a few times to brainstorm. Yeah. Uh, and then it was the birthplace that Mark came in and, and offered up to produce the show here. That's become uh, the lifeblood of the show. And, and even Johnny... Z was uh, welcome into the group there at Daily Grind yep. as well. So yeah. many meetings. I, I, it had a lot of sentimental value to me because I felt like it was it was the second birthplace of the show where, where you and I put the beers down. <laughs> Yeah. eventually and made it an actual it was literally we'd have our business meetings there that were uh, sometimes yeah. a few hours trying to come up with this great concept that's uh, that was one of the first i might remind a lot of you uh cfl podcasts out there so and uh anyways it was just it was <laughs> tough uh but uh luckily like i said no one was hurt and um three very successful uh independent businesses hopefully they can all bounce back and kind of hopefully the community i think the community is kind of rallying behind them yeah and uh, for those of you, um, yeah, who are ever in in Ottawa, uh, hopefully next time you go down to Somerset on your way to Bronson, you'll see uh, there won't be a hole in the ground anymore. Hopefully they can they can bounce back and do something there. So, yep. Anyways, we're gonna get into on. a game recap here in a few minutes, but of course we got the one and only Santino, and he's talking about the kill shot, which is amazing. Cause yeah. Again, we go back to you and I sitting on the couch yesterday talking about that very play. Yeah, uh, to uh, go for it on third and goal. I swear that ha- this happens every week. Like 
we have this it's like santino is, is eavesdropping or we're eavesdropping on him or something so when we got into chat yesterday i i or yeah yesterday i believe it was i'm all mixed up yeah it was yesterday i told santino i can't talk to him about it i'm like i can't i gotta save it for the show because i want to see what you're i don't want to influence what you're writing and i don't want you to influence what i'm thinking so. right and he's like that's fair it's cool and then he's in any he sent it this morning and i saw the the rant and it's about the kill shot and he's once again right on key and point with what he's talking about so so I we're, like we're going to let him basically cover that. We'll talk about it a little bit yep. in the game recap, but he, he pretty much um, covers all the bases there, so we'll let him do his thing for sure. As per usual, Janine? Yeah, rocking it uh, as she always does, and uh, we love her her support. And she came out and joined me after the Gigi's game um, for some for some courts and some meatballs at the Prescott. So it was good to see her. She's a hardcore fan. Unfortunately, her Gigi's lost, and uh, they didn't make the playoffs, but... Uh, can't win them all. Nope. Um, so she's doing her around the CFL. And uh, yeah, then that we're just going to get into a little game recap action. All Can't right. Wait. See you on the other side. Hey guys, thanks for listening to the Bleed Red Blacks podcast. Check us out on Twitter at Bleed Red Blacks and on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Bleed Red Blacks podcast. Live from Brazil, here's the Red Black Renegade rant with Santino Filoso. Are you ready? <laughs> Nothing wide receiver is worth 40000 more than Chad Owens. We'll do it live! If the helmets weren't ready this week, they should have pushed their introduction back. That's begun. On Saturday afternoon, the Ottawa Red Blacks earned their 10th win of the season, in large part due to a ballsy call by the coaching staff. With just 50 seconds left in the game and facing third and one on Winnipeg's one-yard line, head coach Rick Campbell gave the offense the go-ahead to go for it. Since the game was tied at 20, conventional wisdom might have suggested that kicking a field goal was the way to go. But by going for the kill shot, Campbell showed his team that he believed in them, and they rewarded him by doing their job and scoring a touchdown. By coaching aggressively, Campbell showed his team that at this time of the season, Season, it's about going for the throat and playing to win. That kind of aggressive play calling rubs off on a team in a positive way and sets the right tone going forward. To be honest, even if they'd failed on the QB sneak, I'd still support this decision. Sure, if they failed, Winnipeg would have had about 45 seconds to march down the field and win on a rouge or a field goal, but in all likelihood, with the way that Ottawa's defensive line was manhandling the Bombers' offensive line, you gotta think that the Red Blacks would have had a pretty damn good chance of scoring a safety. The decision to go for it reflects confidence in the the entire team. Offensively, it says, I trust my offensive line to pick up a yard. And defensively, it says, well, if everything goes to shit, I trust you guys to stop them from putting up any points. As Campbell explained, quote, I told our guys at the beginning of the game, we're going to coach to win football games and we're going to play to win football games. I needed to back up my words, end quote. Often football coaches are accused of being conservative and just making the safe play. In this case, the safe play would have left Ottawa up by three and a ton of time for Winnipeg to march down the field and tie and send the game to overtime where anything could happen. You can't always play pedal to the metal aggressive, but in this case, Campbell saw an opportunity for a kill shot and wasn't afraid to let his team take a swing. Huge props to him for that, because heading into the playoffs, that's exactly the kind of attitude I want my coach to have. That's all for this week, guys. Make sure to rant back at Red Black Gade and remember to bleed Red Blacks. Hey guys, thanks for listening to the Bleed Red Blacks podcast. Check us out at bleedredblacks.ca for blogs, photos, and podcast archives. Dude, isn't she a Bombers fan? Let me laugh even harder. But for the love of God, please start hook sliding. Dude, whatever. She's an Ottawa fan too. Did Buck Pierce's constant injuries not teach you guys anything? Playoffs? I just hope we can win a game. Enough ranting. On to the games. Really? Righteous. Welcome to Around the CFL with Jin on the Bleed Red Blocks podcast. Week 18 of the CFL season kicked off in Hamilton, but the Tiger Cats weren't there. This one was another road home game for the road show that is the Toronto Argonauts, who were meeting the Montreal Alouettes at Tim Hortons Field. The Owls had to, had to, had to make something happen if they have a hope of making the playoffs. And make something happen they did. This game was all Montreal, all game long. An extra week to learn the playbook did Kevin Glenn some good. He went 27 of 35, 294 yards, three touchdowns, no interceptions. And his receivers came 
came through for him. Cunningham, Stamps, and Green all dropped easy passes in Week 17, but this game they all made clutch plays to keep the Montreal offense marching. Stamps reeled in one of the three touchdowns along with Brandon Rutley and Tyrell Sutton. Sutton also added a rushing touchdown to the offensive totals. As for the Argos, they could not get anything going all night long. Harris did not look good compared to some of his stellar outings this season. Maybe it's last week's loss, maybe it's the grueling four games in 17 days combined with being kicked out of Rogers Center, or maybe the talk of him being a possible MOP candidate is adding some pressure that he can't deal with. Either way, he was mentally not in this game, and he got yanked in favor of Ricky Ray in the third quarter. Prior to getting pulled, his completion rate wasn't that bad. He completed 11 of 15 passes for 102 yards, but Harris just couldn't manage to put up a touchdown and did manage to throw an interception. In Ricky Ray's first outing since coming back from a shoulder injury, he managed 12 of 15 for 104 yards, no interceptions, but also no touchdowns. Montreal's D was just too dominant on this night. The Owls, who I don't think any of us can figure out this season, end up taking this game 34-2. They keep their playoff hopes alive, and they hope to get a little help from Hamilton and Ottawa in their games against BC and Winnipeg. The BC Lions got their chance to keep pace with the Owls immediately after the Montreal-Toronto matchup. Many of us were predicting that this would be the game of the week as two young and talented quarterbacks, Jonathan Jennings for the BC Lions and Jeff Matthews for the Hamilton Tiger, Tiger Cats, squared off against each other. Statistically, the two of them were pretty evenly matched. Jennings went 23 of 33, 247 yards, three touchdowns, and one interception. Matthews went 22 of 32, 270 yards, two touchdowns, and two interceptions. Both of those interceptions belonged to BC's Ryan Phillips, who had himself a good game. In fact, BC's defense really dominated, which hasn't really happened yet this season. They got to Matthews five times for the sack, compared to the one and only sack on Jennings all night. Adam Big Hill, unsurprisingly, recorded one of those sacks, along with nine tackles. They also held a returning CJ Gable to only 45 yards on the ground, stopping him from having the kind of impact that he did last time he played in week five when he racked up 128 yards on the ground. On offense, BC was able to play a full 60 minutes, and they were able to make use of the ground game for a pleasant change. Andrew Harris roared back with 16 carries for 119 yards and two touchdowns. All in all, the Lions put together a great game plan, and they executed it well. As Chris Rainey said during the halftime TSN interview, the key to the game for the BC Lions was to finish, finish, finish. And by the way, that was the best damn halftime interview that I have ever seen. So please, TSN, keep bringing Rainey back every week. Finish those BC Lions did, taking this game 40-13 to against a normally very stingy Tiger Cat defense. So BC was able to keep pace with Montreal, and they both had to hope for a Winnipeg loss against the Red Blacks to gain some ground in the Western standings. I wonder if BC and Montreal were as worked up as I was watching that final minute of play on Saturday afternoon. Colin and Mike will walk you through the game that almost gave me, and probably many of us, a heart attack. Suffice it to say that BC, Montreal, and all of our nation got what they wanted, a bomber loss. The week wrapped up with the Rough Riders' last home game of the season as they welcomed the Edmonton Eskimos. The Esks won their last six straight games despite some dodgy offense. Early on in this one, it looked like the Riders were going to play spoiler and end that streak. Bob Dice decided to get a good look at two of his quarterbacks, Brett Smith, who we already know, and Keith Price, who came to Saskatchewan after he was let go by the Seattle Seahawks. This dynamic duo had the Riders ahead 21-3 against the first place in the West Eskimos during the second quarter. But the Edmonton D picked it up late in the second and kept it going for the rest of the game, stalling the Saskatchewan offense and preventing them from getting another major. Smith finished the night 11-15 of for 191 yards, one touchdown, no interceptions. Price went 7-9, of 84 yards, one touchdown, and no interceptions. His touchdown, by the way, came on his very first CFL throw. As for Edmonton's offense, after getting off to another shaky start, they really picked up their game. Mike Riley threw an early interception but made up for it with these stats. 29 of 39, 377 yards, three touchdown passes, and one rushing touchdown of his own. Adarius Bowman had another incredible game, 12 catches for 208 yards. No doubt that he likes having Mike Riley back. Edmonton's offense finally came to life in this matchup. Of course, they were playing a notoriously bad Saskatchewan secondary, which, true to form, missed tackles that junior high players don't miss. Really too bad for Smith and Price that the Riders D squandered what could have been another win for the Riders and a major upset over the Eskimos. But Edmonton comes back to take this one, 35 to 24. So here's how things look after 18 weeks in the standings. Edmonton is now in sole possession of first place in the West at 13 and four. Calgary is right behind them with 12 and four. BC currently sits in third with their six and 10 record. Winnipeg is in fourth at five and 12. With only one game left for the blue and gold, they 
aren't quite mathematically ruled out yet. They need to win their final game of the season and hope for BC and Montreal to lose all of theirs. That would tie them with BC and since they won the season series, they would get the playoff berth. But there is a lot that is out of their control in this scenario. Oh yeah, and the Saskatchewan Rough Riders are in fifth place at 2-14. and 14. In the East, we have a tie for first place between Ottawa and Hamilton, so the home at home to end out the season between these two teams just got very interesting. Both teams sit at 10 and 6. Toronto is right behind them at 9 and 7. The three teams will continue to jockey for first place down the stretch. Montreal sits in fourth at 6 and 10. They still have a shot at the crossover, but remember, a team can only cross over if their record is better than the team in the opposite division. If the Owls and Lions have a tying record, there will be no crossover. Next week, the BC Lions will visit the Toronto Argonauts, who will finally get to play in Rogers Centre now that the Kansas City Royals won the American League Division Series. Milanovic has also announced that Ricky Ray will get the start over Trevor Harris, which is an interesting statement on how Milanovic feels about Harris's mental state, if you ask me. Saskatchewan visits Calgary to play the Stampeders, and Ottawa heads out to Hamilton, along with a busload of diehard Our Nation faithful thanks to superfan Laura Dell's Booster Club. Have fun, guys. And Montreal heads west to take on the on-a-roll Edmonton Eskimos. Winnipeg will have to sit back and hope for BC and Montreal to lose if they want a shot at playing for a spot in the Grey Cup in their hometown. Well, that's it for this week's edition of Around the CFL. Remember to tweet us back with your thoughts about your league at Bleed Red Blacks and at Ottawa J. Game recap on the Bleed Red Blacks podcast. Game recap. Well, we did it. We needed to win, and we did win. Now two weeks in a row. Um, moving forward, the Red Blacks um, kind of control their own destiny as far as getting that uh, first home playoff game since the early 80s um, and just um, really enabling themselves to miss that, that first week too, getting a bye and scoot, scooting through to the finals. So two huge scenarios that uh, if you would have told us that we were in this position, um, it would come you know, on. Come a long way from last year, eh? Oh, my hey, word. Buddy. My word. My word. <laughs> this time last year, I Mo- would... Oh, my Lanta. All, all we were talking about last year, this time was um, the Hamburglar. Or no, no, that's the wrong time of the year. Wrong time of the year. <laughs> Definitely making some grimace references at this point, though. We have already we had already jumped the shark and went full on McDonald's, I'm sure. I don't remember. I just re- There was a Jeopardy reference near the end of the season. So, so we have come a long way since that Jeopardy reference. <laughs> Where the the gist of it was play for the tie. Oh, it was a play for the tie moment. Play for the See tie. See how I erased that out of my memory. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so obviously all of you just listened to Santino's rant, and um, you don't need to roll the tape from last year. We uh, we now play to win. Yep. And uh, you know, thank you very much, Montreal and BC. Your big W's leave uh, first place up for grabs. Nom nom nom. So yeah. let's let's do this. Let's do it. Um, so I don't know what's going on in Winnipeg. I've never, I've only been there uh, in transit. I've never actually been to Winnipeg. Uh, maybe someone who is from there, like I know one one person in particular quite well from there. Maybe she can shed a little bit of light on this. But um, what the hell do you do on a Saturday afternoon there, right? Where is everybody? Where is everybody? Exactly. <laughs> um, they what sti- else are they doing? Is the big question. They still are fighting for a playoff spot. They have a brand new barn. Um, and apparently, like you said, they're going to make parking cheaper next year. Like that's a good thing, right? <laughs> How do you not go check that out? But gotta go park the car. Anyways, I, I'm just I, I think it's tough to watch a a game uh, with with poor attendance, especially in a, a beautiful new stadium, and uh, that's that's sad to see. And um, one thing that wasn't sad to see um, was the fact that yeah, I already said this. You, we play to win the game, and uh, that's a learned skill. You know, that's not something. It just happens, and and winning's never easy. Kill shot. We're figuring it out. Yep. The kill shot. And exactly. there was an emo- there was emotion behind it. That's what makes this team now likable, uh, and other teams to dislike us because there's emotion that's coming between the game and the players and the fans and the team and and you just we're, talk about what that does for a team. Well, though. we're seeing that passion, right? Yeah. And I mean, what what makes a good team? I, I don't. I mean. A team, you know, fights for each other. They go to battle for each other. They protect each other. They work hard for each other. A team is selfless, you know. Um, what we have is a team. We laid that foundation from the coaching staff right to the ownership, office staff, from the water boy to the quarterbacks. 
I mean, passion is display when this when this team hits the field. And I came up with my hashtag the other day was hashtag buying in. And I came in with that with just this the, the sheer attitude of this team. And even at the wide receiver core, I saw Ellingson. I know he was one of many, but Ellingson's running up field and throwing blocks like a maniac. He's grabbing Powell by his shoulder pads and dragging him through the scrum. Yeah. That's a team that's buying it. And that's a wide receiver that's like, we need two more yards. I'm coming with you, son. And that's 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 not just Greg Ellingson. That's the that's the whole core of that team. And you saw the 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 madness that came over that team when Burris went down. You, and you, the madness of the fans and the madness of 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 the sideline and the and the guys on the field. So, guys, I'm I'm in. I'm with you. Hashtag, yeah. we're all buying in. And to it's, our it's, it's amazing, and it's uh, it, it it makes us proud to see seeing people stick up for each other like that. It's uh, it's a family, and it's it's impressive. That 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 okay salute that came from Henry Burris as he got up and started to shake off the cobwebs of getting his leg, you know, turned sideways. That's going to stick, stick out for me as probably a, the, the turning point of this team as they go down the road here. It was definitely a unifying moment. And Hank uh, continues to be the man. He may have struggled a bit during the second half, but uh, he still came through and it mattered. And every week the line is, uh, is impressive. 29 for 43, 413 yards passing, one touchdown, two picks, okay, whatever, but he's still moving the ball and he's still giving our, our, our uh, team a chance to win week in and week out. And and uh, another big milestone for old number one, hits the 60,000-yard career passing mark. So good on you, Hank. That's uh, that's pretty amazing. And, um, I mean, we can't we, – I just can't say enough good things about this guy. Yeah, we were watching the Pats game. We saw we saw. <laughs> I like this note. We saw Tom Brady's ability to sneak it in at the one yard line. But yeah, you you get nervous when you see Henry doing that. You know, you see a lot of other teams bringing in their second string quarterback like uh, 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 to handle any short yardage. But Henry just got right in there and made the move. So and it's quite common. And I mean, um, I understand protecting your guy, but if he if he's the best guy to do it. Um, like like Coach Campbell's made it quite clear, we're playing to win. So, um, so there's a lot of attention um, regarding the low hits on Hank. Uh, some would say a definite intent to injure. Um, this needs to stop now, uh, or Jason Moss is going to wind up in jail big straight time, up. Big time. I loved, and that just goes right back to whole this whole what is this team hashtag buying in. Um, his reaction, like this guy loves that this team. This guy loves Hank. That that wasn't a normal reaction. Like that was a that was a, a brothers fighting for a brother. He and, was going into the scrum. If and, there would have been a if there would have been a dust up, he was he might have been he might we might not have seen him for the rest he, of the season. Yeah, and I, he's a very <laughs> I've had a I've been lucky enough to meet him on a few occasions this year. Always very reserved, very calculated, um, very um, uh, just one of those guys that doesn't speak unless it's real, like unless it's worth saying, you know. Yeah. And to see him fly off the handle like that and get emotional, I knew that. I know that just, I don't know, that really resonated me. I, yeah, I, I liked, really liked that. I liked it. And Big Man Chu got in there. He gave him a few. And Big he, Man and Chu, Chu pulled him back. Yeah, yeah he, had so. a, he had a good, he had his bear paws so, on there. So, anyways, um, just really upset at the pathetic Bombers fans who booed Henry off the field. But uh, you know what? We can only take care of our own. And at least they went to the game. I don't know what else there is to do on a Wednesday afternoon, but. I guess you'll boo, boo injured boo quarterbacks. <laughs> yeah, hey, you want to go boo Henry? Sure. You're not there. You're classy. Yeah. You're at the Safeway, bud. I don't know what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyways, um, it was a, like you tweeted out. It was, it was tough watching um, Hank on the field for those minutes. Those were some long minutes. Seeing seeing his butt on the grass there was like like I was sweating. I was just sweating that out. I felt like Janin two weeks ago when we saw him go down. At uh, we saw Henry go down at the game uh, against Toronto. So but sometimes there's these little things that happen um, that can really bring a group together and really be that pivotal turning point. And that is and, for me. And, and that could be it. That 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 really could have been it. And uh, like I said to you today earlier, not to get ahead of ourselves, but we're four consecutive victories away from a Grey Cup parade. Like that, just just think about put that, that in perspective. Four. And those guys aren't going to think like that. Now, no, we no, will. I, I, but I know. we will. Right. Yeah. And I'm just saying that this turning point, I'm really going to remember this moment moving forward. I think it's really not only defining our team as a team, but uh, this whole expansion, like, oh, that's done. Like, 
I hate that. Talk. We're 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 a we're an A plus football team. Yep. On and off the field. And and that's and that's just yeah, they keep proving that. Speaking so. of A plus broken yeah, record. Broken time. record, here we go. Um our wide receiver depth is sick. And that's good sick. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's what the kids say. <laughs> that's what the kids, what the kids are saying. Johnny Z says it all the time, so the kids yeah, must okay. be saying it. Speaking of Johnny Z, amazing zip up sweater. Um, at the Prescott on Saturday, he showed up wearing this handmade uh, sweater that would have envy of all hipsters across the world. So good on you, Johnny. Nice, Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's our hipster update for the week. Yeah, yeah. Center Town hipster update brought yeah. to you by handmade sweaters. I rock it. <laughs> um, broken record. Here we go. Our wide receiver depth is sick. Sinopoli eight receptions for 120 yards. Chris Williams, seven receptions for 91. Let me ask you where he was catching those, in those soft zones, eh? Like, just know. broken record. There we go. Move along. <laughs> uh, and a, a streaking long of 51, which was nice, that touchdown. Uh, Greg Ellingson, you got a lot of time for this guy. Uh, four receptions for 87 yards, and if they kept track of blocks and, and play away from the ball, he, he'd be as impressive as anyone else on the field. He's, he's really stepped up his game. And... Uh, Obviously, the wily old vet Ernest Jackson comes through with five receptions for 67 yards. So, um, you know, with that effort, uh, Sinopoli is now the second wide receiver in Bled in, in, in Bled Red Blacks in Red in Red Blacks history. Yes, English. This is an English speaking podcast. <laughs> um, <coughs> to eclipse a thousand yards receiving, and uh, he's making a very strong case uh, for most outstanding Canadian. I mean, he's still learning his position, and uh, I think it's scary that the best is still yet to come for this kid. So we're yeah, we're taking on a, a wide receiver in Sinopoli that's that's going to find his. And he got him locked in for another what year, two years, and uh, that should be enough time for him to sort out whether or not, you know, what kind of receiver he's going to be uh, down the stretch. And he, I think he's going to be one of those guys. He's going to be a go-to guy as we go forward. So, and. Um, I like this. You look at these numbers across across the CFL and uh, top receivers. Uh, Chris Williams is is fifth, and uh, Brad Sinopoli is number sixth. Uh, but you look at those those names that Brad's behind. You know, S. J. Green, Mister McDaniel in Calgary, Emmanuel Arsenault, Bowman, Rogers. We're talking some aside from you know Rogers is having a breakout season. These guys uh, were saying they're elite, and they are elite, and they're hanging with the big boys, and they are proving that. You know, we do have, you know, five top class. And it goes back to the type of receiver that Sinopoli is because you look at his average catch, it's 12.1 yards. That doesn't say a lot. That's a, You don't want to look at the that objectively. You want to look at those crazy numbers above him where guys are going 15 and 16-yard average catches. But that's because Brad's, not, Brad's on the inside. Brad's making those catches in some dirty areas. He's in that same area that Ellingson's making catches, that slot slant that yeah. area tough yards tough tough yards. so those are those a thousand six yards he's got those are you know 12 yards at a time he's he's grinding hard and uh yeah i'm curious to see what uh what he does have in store for us like when he becomes number one you know yeah so um another big surprise last week um at running back mr william powell yes 22 rushes uh welcome to ottawa buddy well, like, that's, <laughs> yeah. uh, i know uh you know i just Jeez, Dejardin just knows where to find them, right? Uh, he's the real deal, and and you and I we have a favorite number called fifteen touches. It's your it's your uh, what do you call it? Uh, statistical um, anomaly, I guess. That team that has fifteen touches with a great running back knows how to win, uh, and it's just balanced and effective. Yeah, uh, you know, you can when we continue to lead the league. In, in total offensive yards, like 410 yards a game and passing yards at 328 yards a game, really that's part of part and parcel because we have a revitalized running game. So that running game is kind of allowing us to move the ball around a little bit more, and it's giving teams something to think about. Uh, this offense is a force. Yeah. Just, just straight up. Uh, shout out to Richie. I know he's excited about the new Star Wars movie. So am I. Um, but so is everybody. Yes. But what a let's not talk about that one. But my phone lit up on on Saturday night because again, friends think that I'm I'm the new Don Brennan or something. They're asking me, "Wow, where did we find this Powell guy?" Like, you know what I mean? Like, those 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 occasional observers of the team 
are texting how awesome it is to watch us now, number one. Yeah. And number two, they're starting to figure, oh, where'd this guy come from, right? And I think that's great. I mean, that says a lot about, you said it, uh, the, the GM of this team just knows how to find players at the right time. And that depth is hopefully going to lead us into some more uh, victories down the stretch here. Um, yeah, so um, let's talk about the D block. So Boy. the big boys came to play, and pressure, pressure, and more pressure on Matt Nichols. You know, no wonder it was so easy for Coach Campbell to go for it at the end of the game. You know, we're going to stop these guys regardless. You know, if we get stuffed on fourth down, we're going to get a safety on these guys. I swear to God, that's a, the confidence level they're running at right yeah, now. Yeah, imagine that D-block peacocking after that. They knew that call was being made on their behalf. There's some big chests. And that's big chests. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they are. There's some big ones there. <laughs> and the confidence level was... You have to go through the door frame sideways if you're peacocking with those boys. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, so Justin Cabasati, once again, um, this comes to play. Uh, three of the team's six sacks, giving him a team high 11 on the season. Um, the Red Blacks also moved into first on the CFL sack list picking up their 52nd sack of the season late in the fourth quarter. So, um, yeah, we got we got our team streaking on both sides of the ball here, man, and uh, it, it's pretty exciting to see and, and even more exciting to, to talk about, to be honest. Yeah, and I just want to quickly add in there, uh, Moton Hopkins had a, one hell of a game with three tackles and a sack. Uh, absolute beauty out there. What a great and year fan he's favorite, had. Fan favorite, uh, show favorite, uh, yeah, just finally given a chance to play and finally given some minutes, and he's he's showing us why. So. And and some of those Capasati sacks were assisted by Hopkins because he was just wrecking that inside uh, offensive line. So yeah, good on that team. I was watching that D line a lot uh, from home on the couch, and it just felt good to to watch a team that was able to shut down an, an offense and leave the game in the hands of the coaches, which meant you know both sides of the ball could win that game either way. So good yeah. on us. Um, so at DB, at DB, so, so Brandon Thompson, he had two huge interceptions and I mean, this kid led, led, uh, the red blacks. Um, I'm having a hard time speaking today. <laughs> I don't know what it is. I don't know like, if you, maybe if you just beep it out every time I screw up, people will think I'm just in the sauce or something. <laughs> maybe that's what I need. <laughs> um, anyways, he led the red blacks, um, with four interceptions last year and was fourth on the team in tackles with 57. Uh, he dealt with some injury problems earlier this year, spent some time on the IR, but uh, hashtag depth, like uh, we just, you know, one guy goes down, another guy steps right in, and it just says a lot about, uh, yeah, this coaching staff and the team, like you said, that Desjardins has, has put in, in front of us here. Kenny, we talk about him every week. He's still being targeted, but, boy, is he working hard. He leads the team, a lot. Was he, I guess he led him last week with six tackles, uh, and, and basically he's, he's moving into that head-on-a-swivel attitude where he's kind of keeping an eye on yeah. on what's going on around him a little more, and it just improving, and that's what you want to see from a young player like like uh, Kane. Uh, what do we call him? Kane 2, 2.0, basically. Uh, <laughs> Gerald Gavin's. Uh, yeah. So he left the game. Um, and didn't didn't return, and uh, I haven't heard um, what's what's going on there. But let's hope he's on the mend, um, as our defensive back group needs him, and like he was our Ken A last year. Yeah. So uh, I got a lot of time for him, and he's he's really turned it around, and hopefully he he bounces back. So the the moment we've all been waiting for. That's the kind of person to say a toe to so, but you know what? A toe to so, a fucking a toe to so. A fucking toe to so. <laughs> All right? I toe to so. A fucking toe to so. <laughs> Jamil Smith is back. <laughs> oh, boy. He looked awesome. Did he ever? He looked eh? very comfortable. <laughs> and um, as comfortable as you would expect for someone who's been away from the game, coaching in Muncie. Muncie. Uh, yeah, in Indiana the, in last, the last few months. Um, so we had four kick returns, averaging 22.4 along a 36. Uh, not too much um, room on punt returns, but he still did average more than what we have been averaging on punt returns. And we like to see him back there. I mean, that's the point, is that he's back there making punt returns. He, he protects the ball. He at least gives us a chance to spread the field. And the other people who have been, I assume the problems at the game has been creating anxieties within our other players who yes. have been looked at for that and now they can focus on their own duties so i think this is just great uh from top to bottom what you see out of that too is there's a difference when there's a run and catch 
once the ball hits hits Jamil Smith in the numbers, that new number, 84, what a beauty. Yeah, weird, right? I know. Eh? But it, the, the ball catches him in the numbers, and he moves immediately. And, I, and it's nothing against Chris Williams, but if you go back and watch the tape, there's a hesitation of, I want to look where I'm running first. Smith looks before the ball gets there, takes a quick look at a gap, catches the ball and runs. And that's a... Uh, I don't know. I'm a special teams guy, so that that's that's more important is is seeing where you're gonna go when you get the ball, yeah, uh, and, and having your feet moving when the ball arrives in your chest was something I didn't see. We talked about hesitation moves. It, it's clear as day that the, the hesitation that Williams was having back there was affecting any return period. So, and he he's now proved to be a, a elite receiver, and uh, if if Jamel can alleviate some of the pressure on him, this is amazing. So great to see him back in town. Told you so. <laughs> um, so Ronnie Peffer uh, finally came to play. Um, he had one, even with one crappy punt. Yeah. Um, this CIS grad um, still had nine punts for forty six point eight average, and a long of sixty. So keep your head up, kid. We need you. You got the right passport. Passport and. Um, yeah, Paul Pfeiffer love, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> Milo, uh, two for two, right? What else are you going to say about it? Just keep up the good work. Uh, Santino's now referring to him as Money Milo. So Money Milo. I like that. And since he won the the money, the bag of money on that trip to Regina, it's, it's extra awesome. So <laughs> Money Milo. Don't spend all the, that money on tattoos, <clears throat> bud. Nice. <laughs> um, so basically to sum it all up, we play to win the game. Um, uh, you know, I'm sure you heard Santino's rant, but end of the game, fourth quarter, you know, less than a minute left. We could have kicked a field goal and, uh, we didn't, we decided to play for the win and, and we went for it fourth and goal, got the touchdown and, and really changed the whole, the mentality of this team and this fan base yep. to expect that now. Yep. Uh, we are now expecting wins. We're not expecting losses. And that's, that's exciting uh, from many perspectives. So yeah, we'll get ready here uh, with a with a preview coming up later this week. It'll drop on Thursday, um, and uh, look forward to all the Instagram and the photos of our our, our uh, fan group down in the Hammer. So uh, enjoy that road trip, everybody. Be safe. Uh, drink what you can hold. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, two at a time, hey eh, boys. Um, and uh, and keep safe in Hammer. So um, so any that, travel tip? It? Any travel tips from someone that lived in Hamilton? I'll tell you, don't go north of King Street. Yep. Um, Dundurn Castle is beautiful as long as the sun is up and, um, don't fight any Genos in Hess Village. You're not going to win that battle. So, <laughs> Hashtag booster club. Tight, je- tight jeans and dress shoes. Walk the other way. <laughs> oh yeah. Too it- close to Tony Creek. You don't want to mess around with anyone. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's extra points if they're acid wash jeans, right? Uh, but the rip's got to be organic, though. You can't have not pre-rip from the store, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> and if he looks like Corey Hart, don't punch him in the face. You know what I mean? Keep that keep that beauty face looking. Good. <laughs> um, I know, eh? Because to me, the, the hammer's still like twenty years behind in music. So Corey Hart's what? Is he leading the charts there still, or what? <laughs> I think the biggest celebrity is still Wheels from Degrassi that works at Money Mart. <laughs> Done deal. All right. All right. Speaking of music. <laughs> Actually, Tom Wilson. Hey, now. Is, he's, uh, he's still ki- killing it in the hammer. So. Oh, man. Weren't the, the headstones just... That's what we're talking about, right? A no. junk house. Yeah, junk house. Right. Yeah, so he's actually like a visual artist now and does lots of really cool stuff there. But anyways, I'll save that for the Hamilton podcast. Bud. <laughs> <laughs> hey, now. <laughs> this week's Bytown town Beat segment features The Love Machine with their song, With You. That's from their album... Be Well, It's All Behind Me Now. You can find them. They're kind of an indie pop rock band. I listened to them this afternoon on their lovemachine.bandcamp.com website. Of course, Johnny Z is going to roll us into that. Uh, the music is quite uplifting. Definitely was indie rock. I didn't mind some of it. Nice I was and, too nice nervous and... to search that band name at work, so I, uh, I'll have to listen to it when I uh, Safe search on. <laughs> Safe search on. Love machine. I'm feeling lucky. Yeah. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Somebody can do that? Yeah. Wow, there's a machine you can get that does that? <laughs> Damn. And it's my money now. <laughs> and it comes out of a vending machine in Japan? What? <laughs> All right, folks. See you next week. Gotcha, Sniff. Here at Bleed Red Blacks, we love our football, but we also love the music our great city has to offer. It's the Bytown town Beats, local music spotlight segment on the Bleed Red Blacks podcast. Today's featured artist. Mm-hmm.
The Love Machine. Thank you for listening to this week's installment of the Bleed Red Blacks podcast. All musical content used in this podcast is all local Ottawa talent. If you are a local artist wanting to get your material heard on Bleed Red Blacks, send us a message on our Facebook group. Tune in next time, and remember to Bleed Red Black. Bleed Red Black.